So hello again, this is um, part two, the second accompanying video on the terminology of phylogenetic trees that we'll be using in the rest of the uh, tutorial. It'll help us understand the structure of trees when we see them, uh, beautiful circular layout trees like this uh, of the hexapods. Um, this is uh, reproduced in the tutorial material. Um, and we're going to talk about the branches, the internal branches, the uh, thing called the root, um, and all the other components of this tree, just so that you can follow the discussions that are coming. So a reasonable place for us to start is the is where we would start in doing a phylogenetic analysis, and that's with the information that we have, and that's in general the information about extant taxa, the existing species um, about which we have perhaps sequence information. So this is what we have, and what we want to get is the relationships between those species, those taxa. Um, these, once we have constructed the tree, are going to be called the leaves of the tree. It's a botanical term to help you remember it. Uh, so the leaves are the ones that occur at the, uh, the outermost edge, if you like, or the bottom in this orientation of this tree. Um, we also say that call them tips and uh, they generally correspond to living species because they're extant. We might have leaves in a tree or perhaps um, other nodes in the tree that correspond to fossils, but we won't be using those today. Up above the leaves, we have hypothetical common ancestors of each clay, each group of um, each other's closest relatives. So we have hypothetical common ancestors labeled in a purple color or lavender color. And these are the things that we want to recover. Those tell us the structure of the tree, the relationships between the species. Um, one node is very important in this tree, it's called the root, and according to this tree, which is a statistical estimate of the relationships between the species, it is the common ancestor of all of the extant taxa, so that it goes at the top of the tree in this um, representation. I'll just skip back to the first tree we saw, the big circular one. Here, the root is right in the middle of the tree and all of the branches are extending outwards from the root, forwards in time. Uh, in this example, the existence of a root at the top of the tree, uh, all the branches are extending away from that, downwards in the tree, forward in time. A root gives us that direction. So once we have a root in a tree, it's really uh, powerful because then it's, um, it helps us understand the direction of evolution. The root is an internal node. Um, all of them now are being replaced by um, lavender uh, circles. So these are all internal nodes, and that's therefore an external node or a leaf node um, in the tree, the extant taxa. Internal nodes here. The other parts of the tree, um, uh, the most obvious ones are the branches. And so an internal branch, this one labeled dirty yellow, as the other three, other two. Um, these define the relationships between the groups of taxa. And so that branch there tells us, and the position of the root tells us that according to this phylogeny, these two extant taxa, taxon four and five, are each other's closest relatives with respect to the rest of the taxa in this set. It doesn't mean to say that there aren't any other close relatives in this uh, what's called a subtree in this group, uh, but of the taxa present here, these are each other's closest relatives. And each of these branches corresponds to one of those hypotheses. So one way of thinking about a tree uh, in general is as a collection of hypotheses that are compatible, that will all fit on the same tree. The pendant edges that's the ones highlighted here in green, um, will occur on every tree. Um, all they are telling us is that the different extant taxa, the tips, are just different from everything else. They're, they've evolved from some common ancestor uh, from which they've diverged a bit. 
So they will appear on every tree and are therefore not, in a sense, interesting because they don't tell us anything about the relationships between the species. Once we have branches, we might think about what the lengths of the branches are. And in this tree, drawn with the root at the top towards the tips uh, at the bottom, we might imagine that the length of each branch is proportional to evolutionary time or the amount of evolutionary work that's gone to turn uh, perhaps the gene sequence at the root of the tree in the common ancestor through the common ancestor of these two down to the extent taxon four, down to extent taxon five and so on. So this might be a measure of evolutionary time or distance. So if this is a true representation of the relationships between these taxa, uh, then the total amount of time, so the total evolutionary distance going from the root taxon four would be represented by this red line, red dashed line. And if all of the evolution was proceeding at more or less the same rate, and these extant taxa were sampled at the present day or at the same time, we would expect those root to tip distances to be pretty much the same. That's a well-known assumption in phylogenetics, which is commonly used, known as the molecular clock assumption. It's not always going to work precisely, and that's partly why I've drawn this tree with some variation in the heights of those leaves, in case you were wondering. Another distance that we can see on this diagram is between taxa three and four, sorry, two and three, um, via this dashed red line here. So along the two pendant edges and the intermediate internal edge. I said edge there, branch and edge, the same thing. The other thing that I mentioned before was that branches give us uh, monophyletic groups, monophyletic meaning single ancestor, and in this case, I've got uh, a monophyletic group that's called a clade. Um, that is the taxa one, two, and three. They form a clade because they're each other's closest relatives with respect to everything else in the tree. So monophyletic clade means they, they're each other's closest relatives. And they're like a subtree, a, a chunk of the tree. If I were to cut the tree where my cursor is now, I'd get a new root of tree and that corresponds to a clade with those three taxa in it. Now, I might be wondering, I referred to the root before as being very useful, very important, uh, how I might find what the root is. And um, one way to do that is to identify a set of taxa that will help me that are not in my group of taxa of interest, but will help me by how they relate to my group of interest in where the root of my group of interest might be. So where I'm pointing right now. To do that, I now think about my taxa, taxa as an in-group, which suggests that there must be some kind of out-group. We'll come back to that in a moment. So the in-group is the set of taxa in which I'm interested and the out-group is going to help me identify where the common ancestor of my in-group relates to everything else outside this big clade of five taxa. So what I do is I build in, I bring in my um, other out-group taxa. Here I've got two. And if I can build a tree that contains all of those taxa, if I'm very confident that this these two taxa out here are a good outgroup, and the taxa inside are a good in-group, that is, they definitely um, aren't mixed in with each other. Uh, they definitely form good clades. Then the common ancestor of those must be up here. This is my confident common ancestor, the in-group and to the outgroup. And that in turn means that the branch where this one joins, this blue branch joins to the um, in-group tree, tells me where the root of the in-group tree is. So this is the in-group, out-group, and how I put them together 
form the, to find the root of the in-group. That's the thing that we're interested in. And as I said, that gives us the sense of direction from the root down to the tips and the direction of evolution will change, like the um, way in which some characters might emerge or uh, get lost. And putting them all, all together, then we have the figure that's in the tutorial with all of these um, individual components labeled again, the evolutionary distance, the how we do um, outgroup routing, um, and all the other terms there. So I, I hope that was helpful. And next time, and next time we'll go on to alignment. Thank you very much.